Deep in the Arabian desert, a line of bulldozers moves mountains of sand to make room for fresh green vegetation. We started our long journey along this road at a time when we had nothing. We did not have the agricultural capabilities, the means, the resources in order to start an agricultural revolution, let alone an environmental one in our country. Nevertheless, we found a way to start this journey. Once on the brink of extinction, the noble Arabian Oryx thrives under the protection of the nation's president. I think that it's a major achievement uh, and it's one that uh, 25 years ago no one would have thought was possible. From the skies, satellites keep watch on endangered falcons. And deep water green turtles. Above ground, priceless water feeds millions of new trees and crops. This is a sooty gull chick. Just about, hatched about two days ago. And against the dawn of a new day, there arrives a new life, safe and protected. We study the wildlife, we watch it, and we want to have an early warning system to make sure nothing goes wrong. This is just the perfect place. Men and nature, together moving ever forward toward an environmental oasis. The Arabian Desert is a beautiful, undulating tapestry, foreboding with no discernible sign of life. Six or so million years ago, Arabia was part of the African continent, forming its northeastern shoulder. Then, it was largely a lush savanna, across which roamed vast herds of animals. Ancestors of elephants and zebra grazed on the verdant grasslands, and hippopotami splashed in the wet shallows. But two things then happened to change life irreversibly. A rift formed the Red Sea, which split Arabia off from Africa and shut down the free migration of animals. And then, over eons, Arabia's climate became arid. The savanna was scorched, the rivers dried up, and the land became the desert of today. Delicate desert flowers, majestic beasts, and nomadic man. Each adapted to the punishing dry desert climate. But with time came development and a rapid decline in desert animals, due at first to the arrival of modern hunting weapons like the rifle, and later to the appearance of the motor vehicle encroaching ever deeper into natural habitats. Disappearing were the oryx, the gazelle, predators like the Arabian leopard, and families of foxes and wolves, the Arabian hare, and the hubara bustard. Into this environment came a young member of Abu Dhabi's ruling family. Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nayyan was raised in the desert hunting tradition. But by the age of 25, the young Sheikh foreswore the use of the rifle, aware that the stock of wildlife was declining. Years later, as the ruler's representative in Abu Dhabi's interior town of Al Ain, Sheikh Zayed sought a way to develop the desert for his people. His son, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, remembers. My father, Sheikh Zayed, was born in very harsh surroundings, a world in which the very concept of protecting the environment did not exist. This really is our beginning. This is where we started. Sheikh 
Sheikh Zayed's plan, the first community water project in the desert. For thousands of years, Arabs have used fallages, underground canals, to transport water from beneath desert mountains to communities eking out an existence in the oases. Under Sheikh Zayed's direction, existing fallages were cleaned and repaired, and a new underground canal built, all by volunteer labor. I remember in those days, we had no resources, nothing even to pay the people who could build those underground canals. There was no money. The riches of oil had not yet come to Abu Dhabi. Water was by far its most precious commodity, and it was not available to all. The families who were farming the land owned the water rights. This water could not be used, therefore, in the public domain. But years in El Ain and among the Bedouin had taught Sheikh Zayed the desert ways of consultation and mediation. He used those skills to persuade landowners to give up their traditional ownership of water resources in the interests of national development. With more water available, more land could now be cultivated. And so began the greening of the Abu Dhabi Desert. Alongside the usual architectural jewelry of modern life, high-rise towers and gleaming hotels, is an abundance of greenery in the Emirates. The UAE desalinates three quarters of its water. The rest of its water needs is supplied by underground aquifers and by dams that capture mountain rainfall. About 10% is recycled to nourish urban lawns, parks, golf courses, and green belts. The recycled water also supports one of the most ambitious projects of its kind in the world, the three-decade-old desert reclamation process known as a forestation. We needed to make this desert green, to make it flourish, and to bring trees into the heart of the desert so that our people could live in prosperity. For his people to prosper, Sheikh Zayed knew the foundation of desert existence would have to be shifted from herding animals to growing crops. They could not continue to survive merely by buying fodder from farmers for their sheep and camels. They needed something else for their livelihood. This was the driving force that gave us the impulse to green the desert. Squadrons of tractors are the forward forces in this offensive. Their job is to carve out trenches in the sand. Beds into which a new irrigation system is laid. One by one, the pieces of pipe are sealed. And then black plastic tubes snake their way out across the sand like umbilical cords bringing water to legions of young seedlings struggling to root and to survive. And many millions are surviving, says Mohammed al Hamali, an Abu Dhabi municipality official. And, uh, changing uh, a place from a desert to a green area, it's, it's really a tremendous achievement. Sheikh Nayan bin Mubarak is the Minister of Higher Education. I think we are more conscious of the importance of the environment than those who uh, dwellers of cities. Uh, we, because this is our livelihood, if you're in the desert, your livelihood is what's there in the desert. It's scarce, it's little, so you have to protect it, you have to take what only necessary, and the sea is the same. This one is Monzonia, but it's not in Ben Obor is a botanist for Abu Dhabi's Environmental Research and Wildlife Development Agency. It's from a shrub called Lycium uh, shawii, it's, a, it's the berry of Lycium shawii, the tomato family. 
You can eat it. It tastes beautiful. He studies the remarkable endurance of desert vegetation. The guff tree is very important both for uh, livestock but also for the, for the ancient Bedou that, that used to live here in the area. Livestock, as you can clearly see, browse on the tree up to the height that they can reach. Animals also nibble on the acacia, another desert tree. This is a fresh gazelle droppings, probably from la last night. Chris uh, Drew is an expert on desert animals. If you look at this uh, acacia plant here, that, that they've been browsing the, the, the leaves off the tips where it's softer than the new growth. They seem healthy enough. Desert dwellers like the hare and the dub lizard are appearing more often. And with each new acacia tree, the habitat of the wild gazelle improves, increasing their numbers in the wild. It appears the nation's determination to green its desert is paying off. In the environmental oasis lives the Arabian leopard. They are very, very rare, about 10 times as rare as the giant panda. We estimate that there are certainly no more than 100 in the wild. 100 in the entire world, a breath away from extinction. Marika Youngblood is a naturalist. The leopards are found in all the mountainous areas of the Arabian Peninsula. A half dozen of the prize cats can be found at the breeding center for endangered Arabian wildlife. This breeding center is, is a godsend. One local guy saw the, le the one leopard we had and said, with almost with tears in his eyes, do you mean to tell me that this animal is in my mountains? And this is the kind of reaction I'm looking for. So that people can get, become proud of their natural heritage. Breeding is the key to the animal's continued existence. In 1998, the leopard's chances improved, at least by one. Behind this door is another rare animal, the hubara bustard, the traditional quarry of Arab falconers. Worry over the hubara's numbers led the UAE to open the National Avian Research Center. This bird is a male hubara bustard He's three years old and has been born and produced in NARC here in UAE. One of the key factors in this kind of project is to have birds which are extremely tame and used to human contact. Scientist Fred Lonnie says the goal is to breed the birds in captivity and then release them to strengthen stocks in the wild. That's really the prime uh, objective of the center to be able to reconcile the Arab falconry with the modern conservation issues. One species that has rebounded from extinction's doorstep is the mighty Arabian oryx. Many of the world's oryx graze leisurely on the exclusive island of Sir Banias, designated two decades ago by Sheikh Zayed for wildlife conservation. <laughs> They are under constant observation by veterinarians and specialists. The oryx share their island paradise with thousands of other native animals, including gazelle, says naturalist Peter Hellyer. At the moment, Sir Benias has got several thousand uh, sand gazelle, mountain gazelle, which are indigenous to Arabia. <laughs> We've planted thousands of trees to create forests for the oryx and the gazelle so that they can feel at home. Sir is, is, a, is a very interesting island. Claude Martin is Director General of the Worldwide Fund for Nature International. It is not, in a sense, a natural habitat in itself. Uh, it, is, uh, it should be considered as, as a breeding center. 
In 1997, the International Conservation Group took notice of His Highness' efforts, recognizing him with its top award for conservation, the Gold Panda Award. Sheikh Zayed is the first head of state to receive the award. Thank you again very much for all your kindness. He felt he uh, merited uh, this award uh, because he has, uh, in a substantial manner, contributed to environmental thinking in his region. A short helicopter ride from Sirbaniyas sits another wilderness habitat, Karnain Island. It's a tiny little dot here in the, in the Arabian Gulf. It's a place that draws inquisitive ornithologists by ones and twos, and birds in the hundreds of thousands. Quite simply, it's the headquarters for seabirds. There's no other island with that um, community with the same species or the same numbers at all in the Gulf and it's absolutely critical for their survival. Ornithologist Simon Aspinall monitors the bird's daily life. The conditions are perfect. This island, it's just three square kilometers more or less, virtually undisturbed. There's a clean sea, it's full of fish, wonderful amount of food. There's no restrictions to them at all. The only condition is they all just, they're packed close together. That's even younger than the last one. Birds are found in every nook and cranny, like this red-billed tropic bird. The only threat seems to be predators who come from the sky. And so, mothers here do what mothers on any beach the world over do. They watch their young carefully. Just 40 kilometers from the UAE's capital city of Abu Dhabi is another bird reserve, entirely man-made. Algar Lakes is an old salt flat converted to collect and store recycled water from a nearby sewage treatment facility. When you add water into a desert anywhere in the world, it's going to act as a magnet for local wildlife, and that's exactly what happens here. Steve James, the Abu Dhabi bird recorder, says some 150 species stop off at Algar Lakes during long migratory journeys, including a flock of rare flamingos. Flamingos are endangered all over the world. They're very vulnerable uh, to all kinds of disturbance. And luckily, in recent years, the greater flamingo is migrating from Russia and the Crimea region, and it's wintering in Abu Dhabi Emirate. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of gulls, sandpipers, duck and waterfowl join the flamingos. Together they grace a most rare stopover of lakes in the desert. It's been a very happy accident, both for wildlife and also for man, because man's got exactly what he wants. He's got control over the recycled water, which is going into Abu Dhabi to beautify the city. And the wildlife has got what it wants, which is a newly created habitat, which it can exploit. The Saker Falcon is a proud icon of desert survival. Arabs have hunted with falcons for at least 2,000 years. Sheikh Zayed mastered the art of falconry, a family tradition. It became a lifelong passion, says his son, Sheikh Mohammed. Sheikh Zayed, My father, it is true, hunts with falcons. But even in this, he sets us an example. Sheikh Zayed likes hunting, but shows us that in hunting, one must draw clear lines and define limits. One must never trespass. Today, many falcons are endangered, with numbers dwindling. 
Their fate may lie not with an ancient way of life, but with satellite technology. Each spring after the hunting season, Sheikh Zayed sends many of his falcons to Central Asia to be released back into the wild. Here they are freed in the Issykul Lake region of Kyrgyzstan. The annual release is part of a study on the bird's migratory habits. Each bird has an electronic ID and lake band. A special few falcons are outfitted with tiny satellite transmitters. Scientists will follow the wild falcon for months. The traditional quarry for the hunting falcon, the Hubara Bustard, has also been tracked with a long-lasting solar-powered battery. In a world first, a Hubara was tracked on a year-long migration from Abu Dhabi north to China and back again, a 12,300 kilometer flight. Satellite technology also tracks the endangered green turtle. Local fishermen often discover the large lumbering beasts in their nets and by law must set them free. I'm covering the eye so the turtle will stay calm. Uh, yesterday we got here about 24 turtles from this area. Today a pair is handed over to scientists George Bolas and Saif al Gaze, who outfit them with satellite transmitters. And we're using some polyester resins almost like uh, doing a little patch job on a surfboard or a boat. If the transmitter doesn't stay on, all the satellites in the world can't do the job. And look at our resin is setting up here, just like we wanted it to, almost right on schedule. Yep. Good. This turtle and this deployment of a satellite transmitter is the very first satellite tracking of a sea turtle in the Gulf area. This turner and she'll go. The satellites will, on a real-time, daily basis, tell us, is the turtle still off of UAE? Is the turtle uh, traveled to some distant area? Well, that's the first girl. Data comes every uh, 24 hours. Nobody knows where it will be going now. Oh, but you will when you look at your computer. <laughs> The sea turtle's data is sent a thousand kilometers up to a U.S. weather satellite. The satellite also picks up telemetry from the migrating falcons and hubara. The data on these three species is beamed down to a receiving station in France, and then relayed by computer modem to Abu Dhabi, where scientists study the findings, sharing them with other countries. Through such an international conservation effort, the Emirates is taking the lead to preserve these endangered species, so much a part of the nation's cultural and environmental heritage. When you do things that require many, many years to come to fruition, you can never be certain when you could expect a return on your efforts, nor how these returns will come. That is when you need to have something much more than mere resources to sustain your drive. That is when you need to have sheer determination. Determination has brought the Arabian horse back home watched over by specialist Deidre Hyde. This is uh, His Highness's private breeding stable. It's been going for some 35 years. Sheikh Zayed's vision to preserve the desert lineage. A lot of it's indefinable, but you know it when you see it, the, the desert horse. They're fine bone, but very, very strong. Colts receive camel's milk and dates, but no air conditioning. The desert is to be forever their home. They have to be tough, they have to survive. Almost single-handedly, 
Sheikh Zayed has guided his country towards survival, setting up the plans for its future. But even he concedes his environmental achievements would not have been possible without resources. The Abu Dhabi National Oil Company is now a partner with Sheikh Zayed in protecting the nation's environment. Keith Gordon is with Adnoc. Forty years of operations has left some junk around the seabed, uh, and we feel it's appropriate that we clean up the mess. A Cleaner Seas campaign includes a pilot project to create artificial reefs, a new home for underwater life. Above ground, waste reduction initiatives include a self-imposed no-flare policy, reducing harmful gas emissions. Ahmed Al Sayed directs Adnoc's environment and safety program. Industry can either take a, a proactive or a reactive Role. We've decided to take a proactive, it's paid off. With even the oil industry joining the environmental battle, the man who sounded the ecological call to arms relies on faith. Having resources in themselves is not enough. You need resources, certainly, but you also need to have an indomitable spirit to achieve something and to never lose faith. Sheikh Zayed and others have not lost that faith. The future is absolutely assured for this island. The owner is so sympathetic, he's so keen on the wildlife of this place. It'll never change. I'm sure that by the year 2000, we will have several nature reserves for leopards online. The fact that gazelles here, this has, it's really worth protecting. And this is a starting point, uh, not a finishing point of an environmental campaign. In our continually expanding, uh, ever populated, human populating world, uh, wildlife take a, a second back seat to human habitation, and we need to uh, carve out their place to ensure that they will be here for future generations. Sheikh Zayed and his people have built a prosperous nation from environmental riches. Now the riches are protected for their children and their children's children. When I started, it was all just dreams.